Well, as people begin to come in, I think we will get started. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning uh, across the globe. I'm David Myers. I'm pleased to welcome you to this conversation on the 40th anniversary of the publication of Yosef Chaim Yushalmi's extraordinary book, Zahor, Jewish History and Jewish Memory. Rare is the book that is spoken about with such reverence and admiration 40 years later, uh, but such is the fate of Zahor, which Professor Yushalmi memorably, memorably described in the introduction as part history, part confession, and credo. In 100 short pages, Yushalmi managed to capture with incomparable erudition and lyricism two major thematic arcs and their periodic intersection, that of Jewish historical writing from late antiquity, uh, from antiquity, and that of Jewish collective memory as it was embodied principally in ritual and liturgical repositories. As those of you who have read the book know, and I assume that is most of us, the relationship between these arcs is the subject of the book. Today is an especially fitting day to convene, convene this conversation since it's the 14th yard site or day of passing of Professor Yerushalmi. Like many here, I continue to mourn his absence. My own encounter with him as a reader of Zahor and as a student was simply put life altering. And I think the same has been true for many of us here, colleagues and students alike. I'm convinced that he would be very pleased to know that we were still discussing his work, uh, that he, as a student of various forms of eschatological thought, had achieved a well-deserved measure of scholarly immortality. Um, we wouldn't be here today were it not for the amazing staff of the Levy Center for Jewish Studies at UCLA, especially David Wu. I'd like to thank David and his colleagues for their work in hosting this discussion which is supported by the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Chair in Jewish History at UCLA and co-sponsored by the UCLA, excuse me, the UC Berkeley Center for Jewish Studies, and I thank uh, its director, Professor John Efron. We also wouldn't be here today were it not for Moshe Lapin, a brilliant and oft-traveled student of Jewish history whom many of us on this panel know. Over the years since he was uh, first, uh, when he first arrived at UCLA, Moshe has become a friend and a colleague. And it was he who first came to me to raise the idea of doing an event to mark the 40th anniversary of Zahor. And so I'd like to invite Moshe to offer some brief opening remarks. Moshe. Thank you, Professor Myers. Um, I would like to begin with a, a quote from the Talmud, something that I, I hope would uh, bring joy to Professor Yerushalmi. The Talmud reflects that one does not come to one's teacher's wisdom until the passing of 40 years. Zachor has had a wide reception, translated into 12 languages, and according to omniscient Google, it's been cited 4,000 times, the majority of which are in the past decade. Yet there is something singular about this reception as well. A work of auto nonfiction written as, quote, part history, part confession, and credo, has been received as such. But how does Yerushalmi's book yield something new for us today? The Talmud seems to suggest that there's more to learning than information, that there's a type of knowledge that can only be gained with the experience of time and perhaps with critical distance. This dialectic is captured in the subtitle perhaps less strange to us now than its readers in 1982. I think this idea and why 40 years is an appropriate moment for reflection lies at the very heart of this work. From its woodcut and dedication to its form as a lecture, it's about history writing and the limits and possibilities of transmitting wisdom over time, perhaps in an age that privileges consuming data above all other types of knowledge, Zahor at 40, is a call to remember a different type of wisdom. I would like to conclude and begin our discussion with a reflection by Anna Foa, recalling the moment of Zahor's first point of international reception, its translation into Italian in 1983. And I quote, <clears throat> Il mondo ebreco italiano e non solo quello ebreco sin amor letteralmente librino in cui mercevano tutte le domande in cui trovavano posto risposto mai dugatiche. The Jewish-Italian world 
and not just the Jewish, literally fell in love with this little book in which all questions emerge and in which no dogmatic answers are to be found. Thank you very much, Moshe, for opening up our linguistic and geocultural horizons, um, um, which I think is amply reflected on our panel today. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to now introduce briefly our distinguished uh, guests, and then we'll jump right into discussion. Um, first is Carlo Ginzburg, who really needs no introduction since he is one of the world's most eminent and well-known historians. Carlo Ginzburg has taught at the University of Bologna, at the Scuola Normale of Pisa, and at UCLA, where I was privileged to be his colleague. His many books, uh, which have been translated into more than 20 languages, move from his masterful utilization of the tools of microhistory in the legendary The Cheese and the Worms to many profound reflections on historical method, including clues, myths, and the, and the historical method, history, rhetoric, and proof, and the judge and the historian, to name just a few. He is the recipient of many prizes for his work, including the Abbe Warburg Prize, the Humboldt Forschungs Prize, and the Balzan Prize for the History of Europe. Welcome, Carlo. Next is Sylvian Goldberg, Directrice d'Etudes and Head of Jewish Studies at the École des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. Sylvie is the author of a number of important works at the intersection of cultural history and historical theory, uh, including these that have been translated into English, Crossing the Abok, Illness and Death in Ashkenazic Judaism in 16th through 19th century Prague, and Klepsidra on the Plurality of Time in Judaism, which was a finalist for a National Jewish Book Award. Sylvie was a close friend and confidant of Yosef Yerushalmi and held a remarkable series of conversations with him that have been captured in the newly translated volume, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, Transmitting Jewish History in Conversation with Sylvian Goldberg. Welcome to you, Sylvie. Our next panelist is Tamara Morcel Eisenberg, who is an assistant professor um, at NYU's Skirball Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies. She studies Jewish intellectual and cultural history in early modern Europe, with a special focus on the history of Jewish law on halakha. Her forthcoming book, tentatively entitled Remaking a Cultural, deals with the transmission of Jewish legal knowledge in early modern Europe from the perspectives of the history of information, knowledge organization, technology, society, and scholarly culture. Welcome to you, Tamara. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce Marina Rustow, who is the Khaduri A. Zilcha Professor of Jewish Civilization in the Near East at Princeton University and Director of the Princeton Geniza Lab. She is a 2015 MacArthur Fellow and a 2022 recipient of the Haskins Medal from the Medieval Academy of America. She's the author most recently of The Lost Archive, Traces of a Caliphate in a Medieval Synagogue. And she completed her doctorate in 2004 with Yosef Yerushalmi as her advisor. Welcome to you, Marina, and welcome to all of our panelists and indeed all of you who are um, observing this, uh, this Zoom conversation. Um, we plan to have a conversation for about 45 minutes or so. Um, please do feel free to send along questions and answers in the Q&A section uh, of uh, your Zoom uh, device. Um, time permitting, we will try to get to them, though uh, I would say that our main task is uh, to conduct the conversation among our distinguished guests here. So um, let me jump right in and ask, um, and I'll begin um, uh, in the order in which I introduced you, um, what is the most striking line or image from Zahor for you? Something that has intrigued, perplexed, or stayed with you since the book's publication. Um, Carlo. Well, uh, first of all, let me say that um, I have a vivid memory of my uh, first encounter with Yerushalmi, and that was really unforgettable. And um, I mean, I would like also to recall that um, Arnaldo Momigliano told me uh, Zahor is an important book. And I was surprised because, uh, I mean, he didn't use to say this about, uh, let's say, contemporary literature, contemporary historical works. So um, uh, that was a, uh, also a kind of unforgettable remark. Uh, I think that, let's say, what struck me was the very beginning. In other words, uh, the relationship between 
the absence of historical writing and let's say um, the, uh, di the historical dimension, which is uh, both in the Bible and uh, in the ritual. And uh, I had never uh, thought about that relationship. And this was really striking. Yep, indeed so. Um, and I'm sure we will circle back to that. Um, let us move now to Sylvie. Um, what, what, what for you was the most striking image or line? Uh, thank you, David, for organizing all of this. <laughs> uh, I have two images uh, which are connected one to the other. The first one is uh, the image of a liturgy. And uh, you probably recall very well when he uh, is uh, telling about the day of fasting for Blois on which he came back in his uh, forward to another edition after the first one, uh, saying that uh, uh, David Bastel, one of his students, came to eat and uh, studied that uh, finally the day of fasting was not uh, up to today, for example. But the main point was the liturgy and the day of fasting, remembering uh, blood libel. The second one uh, is the image of Yudkum. And why are these both images very strongly connected to, my, to me uh, all along the years? It is because for me, they are telling the same thing. That uh, even for the people who don't think that uh, history is worth anymore, because uh, it needs to be demolished, or on the contrary, for the people who stay there, in the enchanted world, as you are, you shall me say, of uh, observance, uh, history is not worth either. So, uh, for me, when I have to teach to students, or um, not even to students, but only to Jews, ordinary Jews, the image of Jewish history is uh, always the most difficult to transmit because there is a gap uh, for the Orthodox Jewry or for the ordinary Jews, those who are fasting on Jewish day, fasting days or, or listening or even reciting the piyutim, they are, are not connected with the significance of the piyutim of those who are thinking that, okay, Jewish history has done his work, we are on a new planet. Both of them are very uh, related uh, to the here and now. I think what we call the prison time, and they don't want to know what was before. And this is the problem of Jewish history today. What do we have to know? What do we have to forget? And this is also something that Yerushalmi reflected very strongly about. And um, I think that for me, both things are the best tools to keep connection as an historian to people who don't have connection with Jewish history. Um, so let me just make sure we understand. Both things are, what are the both uh, things? The two images, uh, yeah. the, for the, the kind of very different people. On the contrary, you know, it's a reverse image. The reverse image, the faster in Yudka. Yeah. 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 Great, thank you. Okay, um, much to dig into there, but let us hear from Tamara. Thank you, and thanks so much, David, for organizing this. It's really a pleasure and, a, and an honor to be part of this panel. Um, the image that really strikes me is when Yerushalmi cites the Talmudic Agarita about Moses sitting the, in the academy of Rabbi Akiva and not understanding what's being said, despite the fact that it's his Torah that Rabbi Akiva is teaching. Um, right. So on the one hand, the whole Torah had already been revealed at Sinai, and on the other, um, to cite Yerushalmi, were Moses transported to a second century classroom, he would hardly understand the legal discussions. Um, I mean, this Agarita is so well known that you can't really describe it as striking on its own. But when I read it sort of paraphrased in Yerushalmi's historian's tongue, especially the formulation emphasizing the absurdity of the anachronism there, 
right, where Moses transported to a second century classroom made it really striking to me because it takes this anachronism that's inherent in halachic interpretation and makes it really explicit by this kind of historical thought experiment, which of course in the Talmudic story, Moses manages to actually convince God to let him carry out in person, which is especially cool. Um, but right, this idea of how how halacha relates to the past, I think is is inherent in this story. It's, it's perhaps also a bit of a maybe missed opportunity for Yerushalmi to reflect more on halacha and on kind of what happens in halachic interpretation, but perhaps we'll have more time to discuss those aspects of it later. I hope so indeed. Um, but let us hear um, for, uh, to complete this uh, opening round from Marina. So uh, I'm also very grateful to you for organizing this um, and also for the opportunity to reread the book, which I've read, I mean, dozens of times, but I actually, it's been a few years since I've read it cover to cover, which I did again this week. And, um, you know, you always find new things in it. Um, one of the things I was looking for um, as I reread it this week was what is Yerushalmi's um, implicit notion of what historiography is? So, you know, he talks about modern historiography, but what exactly does he mean by that? And there are a few lines that I hadn't really focused on before that struck me where, where he kind of, you know, tips his hand. So one is towards the end of the book. He says, for the historian, God indeed dwells in the details though memory protests that the details have become gods. So first of all, it was just so great for its kind of redemption of a cliche, um, you know, such a, such a clever turn of phrase, which I really hadn't noticed before, but also for what he's saying about historical practice, um, because he was somebody who was uh, very concerned um, with, uh, you know, not to let the details kind of take over, to, to let some kind of, you know, inner core um, come through. And I think that's also what's given the book its staying power because empirically there's, there's you know, much that could be revised, but it doesn't really matter because the book sort of has like, you know, there's soul in, in the book. Um, and I was also struck, I mean, just related to that by um, his kind of struggle with this question of the uniqueness of Jewish history. So Jews throughout history believing that his, that their history is unique on the one hand and modern historians on the other, not believing that any history is unique, that it can kind of all be compared. Um, and that got me wondering for the first time whether one of the things that's animating the book, which Yerushalmi doesn't discuss explicitly, but it's, it's there, um, is particularism. To what extent uh, is Jewish history unique um, so he says at the end, at the very end, he says, throughout these lectures, and especially in this final one, I have spoken unabashedly in inner Jewish terms. I trust nevertheless that in the end, you will not regard the main issues raised as intramural. There are hardly any that cannot be translated and generalized, but that has not been my present aim. I will close in the same way, he says, still with a few Jewish adjectives, though more lightly attached, you can easily remove them. So the extent to which one can remove these Jewish adjectives, right, I think is actually something that is one of his core concerns in the book, although, you know, he's not really telling you that. Yeah. Um, th there's, uh, th there, there are several directions we can go from here, um, and I hope we do go to both of them, but um, I, I guess a number of you just raised some of uh, sort of the core tensions at the heart of the book, and I want to just put um, at least one of them on the table, um, which is um, the main thesis of the book that regards the relationship between traditional collective memory and modern critical history, or as Carlos said, the biblical notion of history and the writing of history and antiquity. Um, and I'm just curious about how you process um, Yushalmi's understanding of that relation. Do you find yourself in agreement with his approach? Do you find compelling um, some critical perspectives on that approach, most notably Amos Funkenstein's um, uh, um, qualifications of Ushalmi's understanding of both the medieval and the modern? Um, how do you take to that main thesis? And maybe, um, sorry to put you on the spot, Tamara, you, you, 
Tamara, you, you, you mentioned that, you know, there was a missed opportunity in this sort of, in, in his understanding of halakha um, and, and history. So maybe this is an opportunity for you to jump in and uh, tell us a little bit more what you had in mind. Sure, I'd love to. So, I mean, my sense of, you know, the missed opportunity here is that, you know, he points out this really profound contradiction that happens, right, of Moses sitting and hearing his own Torah being expounded and sort of not understanding. And and the way he resolves it is that, you know, um, I'm quoting here, in the world of Agadah, both propositions can coexist in a meaningful equilibrium. And he almost just says that, you know, in the crazy world of Agadah, these things can coexist. Um, rather than maybe recognizing the tale as, as a real reckoning, a halachic reckoning with, with history and with what happens to um, halachic interpretation throughout history, right? And, and I think the, you know, the, the big distinction he makes in the whole book between um, your main interest being in the, in the meaning of history, right? What he calls memory versus interest in recording the history, right? What he calls historiography, um, right? He, he identifies this relinquishing of, of meaning or of placing meaning first um, as being about historicity and in a way embracing the, the contingency of what happens when things develop historically. Um, and I think in the halachic enterprise as an enterprise, this embrace of contingency and historicity, you know, it's part of that enterprise in, in a very essential way, right? And it's precisely expressed in the story about Rabbi Akiva, where the, the halachic source, in a sense, right, it recognizes that the Talmudic source recognizes that it develops contingently throughout history and human interpretation and sort of the distance from revelation that it takes with every step on, of this. Um, so, I mean, I think no matter how divine the authoritative source that it's described to, the interpretation that takes place because it happens in history, it makes it a very human enterprise and it makes meaning out of something that is in very fundamental ways contingent and human and historic, historically susceptible. Um, and I think that's where you know, he could have interpreted that as a historical enterprise. And I think, I mean, although you mentioned Funkenstein and, and I think, you know, your critique on, on his point about halakha is, is well taken, right? And he wants to read um, halakha as a form of historical consciousness. But it's not entirely clear, right? He suggests several different ways in which halakha might be historical con consciousness, right? Halakha is, is like an event. Halakha is something that should be recorded or just, the fact that Alcha is concerned with historical detail because it's relevant. But, but I think there's this deeper way in which Alcha is a historically conscious or historical enterprise. And that's just at the level of the fact that it's being interpreted throughout history, right? right. And it's and that, interpreted by humans. And that calls into question the distinction between the claim that the Jews, at least in the biblical iteration, are the fathers or parents, we should say, of meaning in history. And Josephus begins a tradition that sort of strips history of meaning um, by uh, articulating this uh, this methodology of a kind of quasi or proto professional historical writing. And you're suggesting, if I understand correctly, that we need not see meaning in history in uh, such exclusive terms. Uh, and halacha is a domain in which um, we can begin to piece those two back together. Okay, I'm interested to know what others have to say about Yushalmi's core thesis um, uh, on reflection after 40 years. Um, Carlo? Yes. I also, as Marina said, uh, reread uh, uh, Zahor uh, recently, um, and I was struck by the fact that um, this is certainly not a kind of a frozen classic. I read it. Um, as a sort of work in progress. And this was striking. Um, uh, I thought that uh, in, uh, in writing the book, um, as Yerushalmi said, there were different avenues which he discarded, but they are still there potentially. So for instance, I mean, uh, at certain moment he said, uh, I'm looking um, at, uh, let's say, 
the distant past from a distance because uh, uh, what is modern historiography is something different. But on the other hand, uh, I was struck by the fact that uh, he was not focusing on the attempts from, uh, let's say, you know, Jewish historians to address a different kind of audience, a non-Jewish audience. So for instance, I mean, uh, the reference to Josephus is a very passing one. And I was struck by the absence of um, a crucial book like uh, Leone da Modena, Historia dei Riti Ebraici. So I think that, uh, I mean, uh, he was certainly reflecting on this, but um, this kind of, uh, let's say, interplay between a Jewish audience and non-Jewish audience um, <laughs> doesn't leave a real trace in the book. Yeah. On the other hand, I was struck by uh, what he said at the end about uh, um, the fact that uh, the, um, I have to read the passage because uh, I mean, it's really a, a crucial one uh, when he said that the Holocaust has already engendered more historical research than any single event in Jewish history, but I have no doubt whatever that its image is being shaped, not at the historian's anvil, but in the novelist's crucible. Now, Yerushalmi here talks about the image of the Holocaust. So let's say historical writing is in a way involved in a kind of asymmetrical fight with the novelist. And so I started to reflect on the absence of a, a real discussion about the issue of truth in this book, which is surprising. In other words, obviously the truth related to the uh, Bible is something different from uh, the truth, uh, which is at the center of uh, uh, the story's uh, uh, work. And so once again, uh, there is an asymmetry. And uh, that reference, which has been uh, noted uh, by and uh, discussed by uh, David many years ago, that was also an unforgettable uh, occasion, I mean, reference to Hayden White's article, uh, The Burden of History, Again, it's something which uh, uh, is related to the image of history, to truth, and, uh, and the fact that, uh, let's say, contemporary novelists are, let's say, look uh, uh, with scorn at historians is something which, after all, should not evoke that word which uh, uh, Yerushami used, meaning malaise. Although he, in some way, projected that kind of criticism. And uh, I mean, uh, in rereading Zahor, I thought once again how I missed a conversation with him because uh, I would have liked to ask him, but why? Why, after all, I mean, uh, this kind of criticism evokes malaise for you? So, I mean, questions which unfortunately can be addressed, but I think that uh, they are part of the challenging vitality of the book, which is uh, really um, still part of a contemporary dialogue. We are not looking at it as a sort of a frozen classic, as I said before. Yeah, it's interesting to ask if you shall be understood it as such, because um, it, it, I think um, it, certainly when answering his critics, he would say, um, that it is all there, um, that I have summed up what I have to say on this subject. And in the uh, new um, edition of the book with Harold Bloom's preface, he dismisses in a sentence or two um, some of the criticisms that have come forward. But I think um, uh, you're, you're right that for his readers, it remains very much an open text um, uh, that uh, that has been enormously generative over the course of 40 years uh, up to this day. Yeah. But I want to hear from, yeah. um, uh, give um, Sylvie and, and Marina a chance to weigh in on the question of sort of the core thesis of the book. Um, Sylvie, you began to talk about that. Um, there's one figure who wasn't present in your discussion, and that's the modern historian, right? The sort of the opposite of, of the foil to Yudka. 
Um, so uh, how, how do you assess after 40 years? Um, Oh, uh, I remember well the discussion I had with Robert Bonfil and with Amos Funkenstein and also with many of my friends who said, I'm with Amos, I'm against Yerushalmi. But why? <laughs> so a time has passed, you know, and today many of my friends are telling me, you know what, I come back to my first impression and I think Yerushalmi was right. In what? was it right? So I think the problem is somewhere else. I think the, the book, Zachor, is a very special book because it's a book written by a historian, which is not an historical book in a way. Uh, it is uh, a book written for uh, his contemporary Jews. I think he's spe speaking to all of his readers of what about Jewish history today. This is the reason maybe, this is my reading, of course, not your Shalmis, yes? <laughs> so don't take it for an, something that he would have told me. <laughs> uh, uh, I think, and uh, I think maybe I have thought this from the beginning, but uh, uh, I'm still on this. I think he's speaking to other Jews and explaining what they can retain about Jewish history. This is maybe also the reason why he's so impressive at some points, why he's taking images from literature, uh, not from movies because he has no so much movies to take on, but literature, which was very strong for him. And uh, I think he's acting a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, of course, you know that he, he loves to be an actor and he loved also to be a kind of prophet, uh, even if he said the contrary. So I think that uh, when he was giving all of his lecture, he was acting like this, telling something about Jewish history and not writing a Jewish historical book. And what do you think was the prophet's message to contemporary Jews? How would you summarize it in uh, brief form? So I, I think, that, uh, so maybe it's also connected with the uh, images I took uh, to start with, uh, the gap. Uh, and for me, when I am presenting the image of Yudka, I'm always using the metaphorical figure of the acrobat. And uh, I think that in modernity, uh, the most part of the Jews are acrobat. They are handing up on the thread. They don't know exactly what is there behind that, uh, but they are standing on that. And I think Yerushalmi was very much conscious of this. Thank you. Um, Marina, let's go to you and ask uh, your thoughts about the, the core thesis at the center of the book. How does it read to you? Yeah, so the, the core thesis, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I want to preface this by saying it doesn't really matter, right, because the book still stands regardless, but I do think that the core thesis is maybe sort of too strongly stated or too Manichaean. Um, I think there are lots of mediating terms, both, you know, Funkenstein's historical consciousness, and we could also think of others between memory and historiography. Um, and part of, I mean, I'm going to answer this from the point of view of like, you know, the working historian, um, rather than from the, the memoirist or memorist, um, which is that the definition that Yerushalmi um, has of historiography is, is quite narrow. That, that struck me on rereading this time. You know, if you define historiography as the kind of history that was invented in the 19th century, then yes, his thesis is absolutely right. Jews weren't writing it until the 19th century, but neither was, neither was anybody, right? But there are many other types of, of history that he, that he would not in the book consider to be historiography. So one of the things he does is to speak of antiquarianism pejoratively, right? For Yerushalmi, antiquarianism, um, that's what you're trying to avoid. That's getting lost in the details. Um, and, uh, you know, it strikes me that you can do a kind of, you can lay out the poles, um, the, you know, either the, the extremes of the spectrum, and there's still quite a bit of the spectrum that remains to be filled in. I have no doubt that he was right, that ritual and slichot and halakha were all kind of highways 
um, of Jewish consciousness in the Middle Ages um, and, and a way that Jews kind of accessed their connection with the past. But there was probably also more historical writing than he lets on. There's a really interesting passage um, on page 40 where he says, should you really want to know what was the medieval historical legacy available to Jewish readers after the year 1500, you need only glance at the development of Hebrew printing, then already in full sway. So he says that in addition to Yosipon, there were only four historical works written before 1500 that were print, printed over the course of the 16th century. And then he says, this was the entire library of post-biblical historical writing that remained in general circulation from all the preceding generations. But that's not necessarily true, right? <laughs> so first of all, he assumes here that printed historical literature is the sum total of historical literature. Um, and, and, and second, um, you know, this is really a kind of early modern issue that he's talking about, not a medieval one. So in the last 40 years, there have been some, you know, chronicles that have been edited um, there's a lot more Ibn Daud than Yerushalmi had access to. Um, there are many works in manuscript. There are manuscripts that circulated in parallel with print. Um, so I think, you know, all of that empirical work remains to be done, but people might not have done it had he not sort of, you know, defined the extremes of the spectrum. Yeah, so super helpful. Um, I'm sorry to leave for the moment the early modern, which is such a rich and interesting terrain, but I'm... Um, so curious, um, and it's been, I'd say, my central preoccupation for the last 40 years when reading this book. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to now turn our attention to the fourth chapter, uh, the famous fourth chapter of Zachor, uh, and the image of the modern historian. Uh, the modern historian, sort of the critical dissector of Jewish history, cut off from the living uh, springs of uh, Jewish vitality, um, the uh, person who caters to the faith of fallen Jews. Um, and I'm curious how you read that. And Carlo, I remember as if it were yesterday, our walks after the encounter between you, Shalmi, and me in the uh, uh, the foothills of the Bavarian Alps uh, at uh, at uh, uh, Elmau, Schloss Elmau. Um, I'm curious how that image of the modern historian uh, that you, Shalmi, depicts in the fourth chapter um, appears to you, um, speaks to you? Um, uh, does it resonate with you? Um, is, is it an accurate description of your own sense of uh, yourself as an historian? Um, um, so maybe, Carla, I'll, I'll impose that burden on you um, as the most senior amongst us. I must say, I, I, I'm unable to identify myself with uh, that image. And uh, I think Marina mentioned, uh, I mean, uh, the implicit criticism of antiquarianism, um, uh, which seems to me very important. Um, actually, I uh, mentioned Leone da Modena, uh, Historia degli Eriti Ebraici, which is a masterpiece of, yeah. uh, let's say, antiquarianism, and also uh, a masterpiece in terms of a political strategy addressing a, a Christian audience. So, I mean, I think it's interesting because, uh, in a way, this pushed me back to uh, what has been, uh, I believe, uh, the origins of, uh, of uh, Zahor, meaning uh, um, Yerushalmi's reaction to Maurice Alvac's uh, great book, Le Cadre Sociaux de la Mémoire. And uh, I think that antiquarianism uh, there, I have to reread that as well, but antiquarianism does not play any role. And uh, I mean, uh, um, certainly what is very important and crucial in Alvac's perspective is, uh, let's say, the, um, uh, let's say, the insistence, the emphasis on the difference between uh, uh, memoir and histoire. And in a way, I mean, uh, Amos Funkenstein's remark about historical consciousness is, I think it has been said before, a kind of bridge between uh, the two uh, notions. But uh, I think that, uh, let's say, it's interesting to have a bridge but uh, the bridge is interesting because uh, there has been a previous uh, disjunction. And so, um, I mean, uh, certainly what emerges from Zahor is a sort of, um, let's say, invitation to reflect on uh, the way in which history is nourished by memory uh, and also memory is nourished by history. However, I mean, uh, I was struck by, um, a sentence at the very beginning of the book, 
when um, uh, Yerushalmi says, memory is always problematic, usually deceptive, sometimes treacherous, for sure. But I think that those elements, those risks, are not really at the center of Yerushalmi's uh, approach. So he mentioned them, but then he goes on and he takes a different direction. I mean, as a contrast, I was thinking about, uh, let's say, Mark Bloch's uh, introduction to Le Caractère Originaux de l'Histoire Rurale Française, in which he insisted on the plasticity of memory, on the fact that memory is continually reshaping uh, its content. And I think this is something which is uh, beyond our bats. Excellent, thank you. Um, Sylvie, I wanna to turn to you um, and ask, you know, you, you suggested that you shall me had in mind as an audience, not the um, uh, guild of professional historians, but contemporary Jews. Um, and if so, would that be a function for the historian that was in fact at odds with his own description of the modern historian um, in the fourth chapter? Or do you think it's actually in some way consistent uh, his own uh, function um, in producing this book and his description of the historian in the fourth chapter? I must yes, say uh, that, in... oh, sorry. I saw there was no, a question. Okay, go on, go on, go on, go on. Did you want to weigh in on that? Gone. Yeah. Carlo, did just, you want to weigh in on sentence. that? I think that in rereading the book, I thought that uh, it would be interesting to have a comparative approach to this book. Because even if, I mean, uh, Yerushalmi was addressing mostly a Jewish audience, I think it would be interesting to have a look and a debate from a comparative perspective. Comparing what and what? Um, Oh, a comparison between what and what? Comparing? Well, well, first of all, I mean, a comparison in terms of um, uh, religious differences and also including, let's say, say, secular audience. But I think it would be interesting to, um, let's say, look at this book in a, in a, in a perspective which is even beyond um, Yerushalmi's uh, explicit uh, uh, intentions. So after all, Every book has unintended consequences. And I think this is the case as well uh, with Zahor. Yes, yeah. I think we're here to address the unintended consequences. OK, Sylvie, please. Uh... OK, OK, uh, thank you. Uh, Yerushalmi writes about the role of a historian as a bridge. You remember that in the first chapter. And uh, it's striking uh, to hear it also uh, what Zunz has written. Uh, do you remember uh, that in his first uh, statement, he said that the role and the function of the new historian, it was at this period of time, the new historian is to be a guide and uh, a spiritual and also a moral guide, okay? Uh, um, uh, being uh, able to, to compete with a rabbi. And I think that somehow Yerushalmi agrees with it. And he thought that uh, his role as a, a Jewish historian at this moment of time, which was also very particular, it was not at any time, it was a very special moment in time. And uh, uh, I think he took it very seriously. And uh, for me, there is also uh, something that uh, uh, is connected directly from Zunz, uh, just for this passage, but also to this uh, statement of the fallen Jews. Have we enough uh, thought about what it it meant for Yerushalmi, this wording, these terms, what are the falling Jews? How a Jew can be fall? Uh, this is a question which stayed open with me. He never explained it, uh, that's for sure. But uh, I'm always thinking about this uh, today because you can see in this terming in many, many different directions. Who are the falling? Uh, are these uh, the first generation of a second generation of a historian, but he's taking on himself the task of a physician. So not this. 
what happened during the lifetime of Yosef, the Shoah. So I think the big missing in the whole story and in the whole statement is the place where we have to put the Jews after the Shoah. And I'm coming back to my gap because uh, for me, it's something uh, very, very important, maybe crucial yep. in the understanding of Yerushalmi's uh, task. Yeah, I, I think one cannot understand the tone, especially of that last chapter, unless one situates it in a post-Shoah context, um, yeah. the sense of loss, the rupture um, uh, from the living sources of collective memory. Um, and um, the dolorous tone uh, that uh, pervades much of that chapter. And yet you're absolutely right, Sylvie, as he says on page 100, the burden of building a bridge, that's a yeah. metaphor that's come up uh, several times in our conversation, to his people remains with the historian. Um, so we have rupture, we have a bridge, and then we have concerns over the efficacy of the historian to actually be a good bri bridge builder, unlike, say, the novelist, as Carlo mentioned in his uh, remarks. Uh, all of which adds up to a very unclear but fascinating picture that has perplexed and animated our conversation for 40 years. Um, Marina, um, uh, as a medievalist, um, I'm curious how you um, uh, uh, attend to that fourth chapter. Yeah, there there is a kind of melancholic tone to it. Um, for me, what's fascinating is there, I think that part of the fallen Jews thing is the assumption that your average Jewish person believes certain things about Jewish history that a professional historian would say never happened or happened differently. Or, you know, there was, there was, that was, I think, part of the dichotomy of the book is this idea that like we were fallen because we understand that the way we were taught things were as children isn't really how they were if you look at it from the perspective of modern critical history. So um, I think there's, uh, you know, there, there's a lot that could be said there, but, but the, you know, as a student of Yerushalmi's, what I was always left with is sort of like how much fun it is to go into the lecture, I mean, I still do this, it's great fun to go into a lecture hall, you know, filled with non-professionals um, who are just there kind of for the Jewish history and to say, you know, to, to bust the myths in a sense. So I think, you know, there was something about Yerushalmi, he kind of relished the myth busting while at the same time not wanting to do away with myth because of its, its importance. Yeah, both of those things at one combined in, into one complex intellectual personality. Um, Tamara, um, I'm curious how that fourth cha chapter reads through the lens of an early modernist, um, which is um, a very interesting perspective to have on uh, the modern period. Yes, I mean, the the chapter, I guess, I reread re re most often is the, the early modern chapter and not no the fourth one. But no um, <clears throat> but there's definitely, I mean, I have two sort of thoughts that go in different directions, one about sort of the fallen and the fallenness, um, which both Sylvia and now Marina with the sort of myth busting aspect of it re really relates to. And that, you know, that goes to the question, I mean, again, back to the thinking about sort of halakha and history and in this context of myth busting, I think it's in um, Funkenstein's critique that he mentions that when he sees halakha as historical consciousness, he does not mean the Maimonidean way of sort of explaining certain, the development of certain halachot um, historically. Um, but, you know, I think there is a connection between those because I think, you know, there's a certain anxiety and danger or fun in myth busting, if, you know, depending on which side of fallenness you're on there in pointing out the historicism of the truths that are meant to be meaningful and eternal. And I think that's exactly sort of where this fallenness or the fear of, of fallenness lies. On the aspect of faith, I mean, I've, I've, you know, taught this part of Zachol as sort of asking what is Jewish history and, you know, why do we do it to students of Jewish history? Um, and my question is, is not on the fullness, but on the faith, sort of why is this supposed to be a faith, right? And what kind of, you know, what, what kind of faith-like things or, you know, 
problems does it purport to solve or address, which I think, you know, definitely at the time of the writing of the book are perhaps obvious, right, to, you know, Jewish historians or, you know, even to a general reading public. And I wonder if they're the same ones today, right? And I'm wondering if it's, you know, questions in, in, in you know, to say it in the biggest possible way, right, questions of what it means to be Jewish, of exile, of, of belonging, of identity. Um, Bonfil points this out in, you know, his evaluation of, of Jewish historiography in the early modern period, where he sort of folds a critique of, of Yerushalmi into sort of that article where he talks about, right, how to evaluate early modern Jewish historians. Um, and I think, you know, he, he points out there that if we define history as being about, you know, political, military kind of actions or national actions, um, it's it's only all too obvious that early modern Jews will not be able to write that kind of history because they're not historical actors in that way. And right in that sense, I think it, you know, it deals with a very central problem of being Jewish in that way. But when I, you know, when I teach it to students today, I wonder if that is the sort of big faith question or, you know, the big theological or, or political theological problem in that sense, right, that turns this into a faith. And whether, in a sense, what definitely, you know, Baron and in a way Yerushalmi as well perhaps are doing in terms of kind of normalizing Jewish history, whether that is, you know, that takes away the faith element of it, or is that kind of the faith problem that Jewish history is supposed to address now? So, you know, I, I have lots of, lots of thoughts about both, oh, both the following. Thank you for that. opening up um, by calling our attention to what actually do we mean when we talk of the fallen and what actually do we do we mean when we talk about the faith or what did you shall we have in mind what fallen from what um and you've offered both sides of the spectrum of fallenness and what does faith mean in this context um faith in historicism faith in scientism traditional religious faith these are all such wonderful questions um alas we are coming to the end of our time together and there's so much more to cover but um i, I do want to um, ask um, a final-ish question, um, really about um, the impact of the book um, on the field of Jewish studies, on other areas of scholarship. Um, in the Q&A section, one of our colleagues, Shachar Pinsker, has asked about the impact of Zachor on uh, the field of memory studies. And I do want to say that there will be a conversation about Zachor at 40 with particular respect to um, uh, it's uh, the interplay between history and literature at the HAS, um, which Shachar uh, and I will be part of Sunday at, I think, 10 a.m. You can look for it in the program. So the conversation will indeed be continuing. Um, but how do you assess the impact of the book on the field of Jewish studies, on other areas of subject, uh, other areas of scholarship? Um, how do you assess the impact of, um, of the book outside of the United States where it was produced? And how do you assess the impact of the book on you today after 40 years? Um, so everybody can have a, a chance to um, uh, address one of those areas uh, of the impact question as you see fit. Um, and maybe we'll begin uh, in the order with which we commenced. Carlo. Well, I think I'm, let's say, uh, I've been rereading this book and uh, I am been overwhelmed by questions. In other words, uh, I think that uh, all Yerushalmi's answers were turned into questions. And I think this is part of the vitality of the book. And this is also the reason why I miss, let's say, a dialogue with him. Um, so let's say questions uh, starting from, well, I mean, uh, they have been raised in this in this debate, and um, um, I mean, starting from uh, what does it mean uh, historical writing uh, in uh, a tradition like the Jewish tradition compared with other traditions. So, I mean, you mentioned uh, the translations of the of, of the book. I think it would be interesting to get a sense of the reception of the book in other cultures. That's the reason why I say that a comparative approach would be fruitful. Yeah, I should just say that 
Moshe and I, when we first discussed the idea of this uh, this gathering, we had in mind uh, precisely that, to bring yeah. together translators and readers of uh, mm -hmm. the book from uh, France and Italy to Portugal to Japan. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and maybe that's yeah. something that we can still manage to pull off. Yeah. Um, next, Sylvia. Yes, uh, I think uh, bringing someone from Japan would be so interesting <laughs> because the culture is so different there and the question of memory and history is completely distinct from ours. So this would have been something. So maybe you think about it for the next time for the next encounter now uh, i would like to emphasize something uh, about the impact of uh, yerushalmi uh, two years ago pierre nora published uh, his uh, first uh, autobiography which he called it uh, jeunesse youth okay and he explained uh, in this book that he he was uh, okay he's a jew but uh, he was never uh, involved in anything jewish but he had an encounter with his own jewishness and it was his encounter with yerushalmi and uh, he said that the date was only 87 that's not true because he met him before. I, I know that, but uh, it doesn't matter. But uh, what matters here, it's the way the people took the book, the way Zachor was read and taken by her whole, uh, let's say, generation of Jews who were alien to their own Jewishness and found in Zachor something who spoke to them. And this is also the reason why I have said before that uh, Yosef Yerushalmi was speaking not um, to anybody else but the Jews of his generation. And uh, I think there is something very true in this, because if you have a look on the people who gave him a stage in France, you could see that mostly, except maybe Paul Ricoeur, who was really uh, a non-Jew and wrote as a non-Jew about uh, Yerushalmi, but other people like, let's say, Vidal Nake or even Pierre Nora, they were Jews. <laughs> And uh, they were completely alienated from their own Jewishness. They never heard anything about Jewishness. And suddenly they discover that there is something that we could use. So I think this is the main point in the impact of uh, Yerushalmi, let's say in France, but I think this is more general because it gave the opportunity to a Jewish historian to say something in uh, uh, a general historical matter. And uh, this was completely new. I think it was the first time it happens, let's say in Europe and for sure in France. I don't know how it was in Italy, for example, or in Germany, but in France it was for sure the first time that a Jewish historian could say something about Jewish history and uh, not in front only of Jews. And I think this is very important. Now, when I am giving as, uh, you know, uh, homework to a student, uh, Zachor, so he discovers here and always same reaction, a shock. So 40 years after, it works. Yeah, I just want to call attention to the capacity to speak in multiple languages um, in such a way that, as you pointed out earlier, Sylvie, um, speaks to a contemporary Jewish audience and at the same time speaks to uh, an audience beyond the conventional contemporary Jewish audience, including but not restricted to Pierre Nora, um, speaks to intellectuals in France uh, who may or may not be Jewish at all. That, that um, capacity to speak in um, such textured dialects within the book is really one of its um, mysteries and great achievements. Um, uh, we are now uh, going to hear from Tamara. In, in terms of in terms of the the work's impact, I think you know there's a reason we keep returning to this, and you know I think it's despite what Marina pointed out earlier that sort of the, the you know binary distinction between history and memory may be 
a little bit too stark as a theoretical distinction, it works. And it gives us a really good and useful and meaningful crisp definition of you know a certain type of being a historian and what that means and and the trade-offs and the prices that you know that involves um you know i think of it kind of as parallel to um a work you know that i used a lot in early modern um right in early modern history which is jacob katz's tradition and crisis right which distinguishes very starkly between the middle ages and the modern period which has a modernist you know is is in a way against everything that I think about, but because it gives you such a crisp definition, it's really a book that's helpful to think with and to think about. And I think there, um, you know, as a contribution, it's just incredibly meaningful and helpful. Great, thank you. And Marina. So um, one of the words that's used most often in describing Zahor is lyrical. There is something about the writing that I think is a model of how like academics can write for non-academics, but so few of us actually do or are capable of it. And so the book, um, I look at it as a kind of uh, like ambassador um, of Jewish history. I mean, as CV was saying, um, it was the first book of Jewish history I ever read long before I imagined getting a PhD in Jewish history or let alone becoming your Shalmi student. Um, and one of my graduate students just today, I said to my graduate students, I have to end class early because I have this panel discussion on this book, which was sitting on the table. And one of them who uh, is a specialist in medieval North Africa and has nothing to do with Jewish history said, oh, I just read this book last week. And I said, so what did you think? And she said, well, you know, I had just sat down and read the Hebrew Bible cover to cover for the first time. And then when I read Zahor, I understood why the Bible remained important to Jews. So there's a way in which the book explains Judaism as a historical faith, right? As, 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 a, as a construct that kind of admits its own existence in time, as Tamara was saying earlier. Um, and, and, you know, there's a kind of, like when the anthropologists actually do come from Mars to try to understand something about Judaism, this is probably the first book they should read. Yeah, well, I remember, um the impact of the book on me um, when I read it in 1982. Um, it not only made clear my life mission from that point forward, but it did so because it transformed Jewish history, at least as I had understood it prior to that point, into the most exalted, cosmopolitan, enlightened, fascinating discourse imaginable. Um, and I remember just saying, I need to be part of that in some way. Um, and I had a kind of circuitous path to making my way to Professor Yerushalmi and somewhat a circuitous path after our encounter, um, but um, uh, to my uh, great good fortune, um, we uh, ended up in close conversation uh, in the last um, year of his life during which he suffered, uh, alas. Um, well, this has been really, um, a most stimulating hour. Um, I thank all of our uh, guests, uh, panelists, uh, for participating in uh, what has been really um, an exciting uh, time. Um, I'll just conclude by saying that um, there's a kind of curious and fitting tension in thinking of Zahor, on one hand, as just a masterpiece, not just of erudition, but concision, um, as if Yerushalmi has neatly wrapped everything up. Uh, and yet, Part of what I think we all take away is that the book's greatness may lie, in fact, in its profound openness to ongoing interpretation. Uh, the answers, and even the core uh, formulation that stands at the heart of the subtitle, are in fact openings to this ongoing conversation, which many of us here today find as exciting today as uh, it was 40 years ago. Um, and indeed, may it continue, um, and may we continue to uh, explore that comparative perspective that a number of us have spoken of. Uh, again, thank you all, and may the conversation continue. Bye-bye.